Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, this is Scott Jefferson with ACES Systems. I uh, want to welcome you again to another webinar series of our COBRA II uh, for the helicopter series. Uh, we'll be talking today about the introduction to the COBRA II and the helicopter balance setups. If you'll notice, uh, this is a little agenda of what we got going uh, for the COBRA II helicopter series. Today, again, the overview of the COBRA II balance setups, the application notes, uh, using the tracks and managing data on June 4th. June 9th, we'll be discussing the tail rotor balance, and on June 11th, main rotor track and balance. Uh, with that being said, I'm going to turn this over to Todd Underwood, who's our technical support, and let him take it from there. Thanks, Scott. Afternoon, everybody. Uh, like I say, hello to all fellow rotor heads out there. Thanks for joining us. Uh, looking forward to spending the next couple of weeks going over the Cobra, uh, some of the important features of it, and walking through some balance processes with y'all. Um, like I said, we're streaming live here from Knoxville, Tennessee. I thought it was funny because that didn't get mentioned. That's a question I get a lot, Scott. Do you get that? Hey, where yes, where are we located? Yes, right? Global headquarters, Knoxville, Tennessee. Everything ACES does, sales, service, calibration, uh, product support, engineering, all comes out of Knoxville, Tennessee. I'm going to throw that out there because I do get that question a lot. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, so let's get started. Uh, on the Cobra, let's, uh, what we're going to go over, introduction to the Cobra II. We're going to go over some typical uh, helicopter kit. What would typically be in there? Uh, the kits are customized, but we'll just go over the main components. Uh, we're going to go over what is a setup and where can I find one, uh, and viewing and editing setups. So the Cobra II, direct replacement for the older model 2020. Uh, right off the bat, a couple of things you'll notice for current 2020 users that you won't see is the, uh, the big color screen and some USB ports. Uh, those are improvements uh, from the 2020 to the Cobra II. Cobra II is still capable of all the uh, same functions, main rotor track and balancing, tail rotor balancing, uh, vibration spectrum surveys, and dynamic propeller balancing. The key components on the, on the Cobra II, we've got two simultaneous vibration channels, two simultaneous tack channels. Uh, it's going to support either optical or strobe blade tracking. Uh, the, one of the newer features is it now auto detects what tracking device is uh, connected. So if you hook a strobe up, it automatically knows. If you hook up our tracks, it automatically knows you're using an optical tracker. Uh, saves you some time making a different setup to, for a different tracking device. Uh, another improvement we've recently made is uh, it will now collect track and vibration data simultaneously. So during a run, press a button in the regime that you're in, it's collecting both at the same time. Uh, reduces all the button pushing and screenshots to get through the process. Uh, just makes it a little easier. Makes it a little better for inexperienced uh, mechanics also. Just a little less button pushing. Todd, do some of our competitors offer that same feature on them? In the, in the, in the uh, category where the Cobra is, I don't believe so. It's more of the process like we used to have, which was collect vibration data, press a couple of buttons, then collect track data, press a couple more buttons, get back to the other screens where you needed to be. So, yeah, it, that, that right there just has reduced uh, the workload in the, in the process uh, considerably. The other thing that uh, I like to mention, especially when you're talking between the 2020 to the Cobra, uh, the 2020 required some external software to move data from it into the analyzer to get jobs off of the analyzer. Uh, the Cobra 2, that's all been internalized. Uh, you can create your reports and download your data uh, with no external software. It goes to a USB port onto a, in a PDF file, uh, easily viewable by any computer. The kit, typically, and I say typically, like I said, because when uh, you speak with the sales guys, they're going to go over what aircraft you have, look at the different applications you have and see if there are any uh, individual brackets or special cables that your application may require. Uh, we have interface cables and, and brackets for specific aircraft. We also have general purpose, multi-purpose brackets that work on uh, a lot of other aircraft. So they'll work through you with that, figure out what you need and put it in your quote. Um, typically you're going to get a Cobra II, obviously. The standard is the tracks optical tracker. Like I said, we do support the strobe tracking uh, for individuals or companies that may need uh, tracking at night, uh, but with the tracks, you're gaining uh, no-tip targets, a lot of, lot of features like the, the strobe. It's a little more accurate. Uh, you're not dependent on the human eye of the strobe. Uh, you also get some 991D-1 sensors, typically two. 
Uh, for most aircraft, you're monitoring vertical and lateral. There are a few that only do lateral. So again, if you, if you fly a Robinson or some of the other aircraft that only have one channel of vibration, you'd only get one sensor. Uh, a phototac, which is an optical tachometer, which we're going to use either on the tail rotor head and on some applications we can use it on the main rotor head also instead of or in lieu of a magnetic pickup. Uh, if you want a magnetic pickup or that's the application you need, we have those also. Uh, you'll also have your associated TAC and VIBE cables. We've got them in a couple different standard lengths, 25 and 50 feet, to, to fit just about every aircraft out there. Uh, and if, if the odd chance was you really needed a custom cable, that is uh, something that we can do also. Uh, and like I said, the USB drive, you're going to get that to be able to move data on and off of the analyzer. And a quick start guide, which kind of walks through some of those steps. Uh, there's some other things in there, a weight scale and, and a few other minor accessories and things. But these are the, these are the bigger items. And so let me see where I'm at now. And right, obviously right there, that's the tracks hanging in the windshield there with the suction cup mount. Hands free. Uh, don't really have to do much to it. Just stick it up there and go. Uh, something we're really proud of here at ACES is our warranty, our support and service. Uh, we have an industry leading five year warranty on the Cobra II. Uh, some of the accessories in the kit, now that's a one year warranty on those, but mm -hmm. the main uh, analyzer warranty is a five year limited warranty. Uh, the 24 7 product technical support, that's myself, and if you watch some of the other webinar series with Josh, uh, you'll know that he is the other uh, product support individual. He does airplanes, which are really boring, but. We still like him. We keep him around. Uh, but we, you know, we pride ourselves in uh, very, uh, very quick responses to issues. Uh, we have an email, obviously, that you can email, and two or three different people see this email anytime it comes in. So somebody's going to get their eyes on it. We have a phone number you can call, leave messages. If it's urgent, leave a message. It goes to our email. So we try and respond as quickly as possible to any uh, any emergencies any of our customers may be having. Uh, for service and calibration, uh, I believe from conversations with guys out in the field, this is an area that we again just blow away some other companies. Uh, five to seven turn time on service and calibration. Uh, day in and day out, they're coming in and out of the back door and 99% of the time it's in that time frame. Uh, expedite services are also available if you needed to have to, you know, if you got a two or three days you need to get it back in an emergency, uh, we can work with you on that. A setup. So that's a word that gets thrown around a lot. And I just kind of wanted to go, we're going to start the basics of the analyzer, uh, kind of what in it, what's in it, what drives it for the helicopter market. The setup contains the equipment configuration and all of the data required to perform track and balance. That's a mouthful. Uh, what's that mean? It means it's going to have the polar charts from the maintenance manual and they're going to be embedded in this program. It's also going to contain all the adjustment information for your pitch links, your weight for lateral, uh, span or cord weights, trim tabs, uh, trunnions, whatever your particular aircraft has, the adjustments are in that setup. Uh, we have to provide the setup and the analyzer some basic aircraft information, the rotor configuration, RPM, number of blades, which one's the number one, are we not going to adjust a certain blade? Uh, all that kind of stuff is implemented in there. These, uh, these setups, as we call them, they can be configured in either inches or metric. Uh, people prefer different measurements. Uh, we typically go with whatever the manual has in it, and then if you want it converted to a different uh, uh, measurement, then we can do that for you. Uh, they can also be configured, with, like I said earlier, with a mag pickup or an optical tax source. And for the one-off kind of applications or uh, you know, I work with some customers that have very old helicopters that uh, don't, can't fly the speeds that are listed in the manual anymore, uh, just for, uh, you know, age, <laughs> I guess they're, they're Hillers and Bell 47s, and we can modify those setups uh, so they're collecting data at the speeds and the, and the regimes that they need. Uh, that's up to the customer, but we can help work with them and help them do that to create those custom setups. You won't find those on our website, by the way. Uh, the setups on our website. Just down there at the bottom, you can see they can be downloaded from the asissystems.com in the technical library. Those setups are going to be made with the information from the maintenance manual as the maintenance manual uh, dictates. Uh, so we, uh, we kind of stick with that for the ones that we publish out there. And then if you need something different, uh, we'll work with you on that. So like I said, you need, uh, I want to talk about loading setups, but to get a setup, uh, how do you get one? You have to go to our website. You have to register on the website. 
Well, what do you got to do first, Scott? You got to buy an analyzer. That's right. You got to buy an analyzer. Once you buy an analyzer, <laughs> then you'll get registered on the website. Uh, we'll give you a username and password. That'll get you in there to where you can download the setups. From that point, it's a pretty simple process. I'm going to uh, switch over here to the analyzer and I'll show you. I'm going to put my USB drive in. If I can, there we go. From that point, I'm just going to scroll down to analyzer management. Press OK. I'm going to go down to database management. Press OK. And then the top line there, if you can read it, I think it may be bleeding out. It's so import setups from USB drive. So we're going to press OK again. Analyzer is going to go through its process of downloading this. Once it's done, it's going to show the import results screen. And it's going to give us a list of setups that was imported. Uh, and if you'll also notice off to the side, there's a small block with uh, either S or A in there. Uh, that's skipped or accepted. Uh, if there was, there's about, about three or four other symbols that can pop up there and they'll tell you the status of that import, whether you overrode an existing one, uh, if it failed to import, uh, whatever it may be. And if you look down at the bottom, you can see the generate report. You can actually press that key and it will generate a report of the setups that was imported uh, if you wanted to keep that as for a record. And as you can tell over on the side now, our pending reports went to one. Uh, later on, I'll show you, and I believe it's next week when we're talking about reports, I'll show you how to get those reports off of the analyzer. It's, a, again, a very simple process, and they transfer over to the, the uh, USB drive. But today, we want to look at setups. So I'm going to press continue to get out of that screen, and then I'm going to press back to get to the main menu a couple of times. We're going to go up to main rotor track and balance. We're going to look at a setup. In order to do that, we click on main rotor, we go down to manage setups. Now here you've got some, some choices. Uh, you can view setup policies. This, the, what that means is when we put a setup on the website, we lock them so individuals cannot edit them. So that would, that would allow you to do that, uh, to view the setup policies. You won't be able to modify the setup policies. Uh, without the correct license, that's something that we have. You can export that setup. Uh, say if you want to take that setup off and use it on another analyzer, uh, you can export it. Again, all these features go feed back to the USB drive, and then you can import it into another analyzer. Uh, you can delete it, uh, say you no longer have that type of aircraft. You can create a document, you can create a report that shows you all the data and all the information that's in the setup. You can create a new one by manually entering all the information, but it, it, I don't recommend this for helicopter guys uh, unless it's a smaller, very simple aircraft because uh, there's a lot of information and there's some critical information that if it's input incorrectly, you'll have a really tough time getting a track and balance done. You'll have erratic results. What we're going to choose is edit. We're going to press OK. Now these setups are the ones that are installed on this analyzer, some of them I just downloaded. Uh, which one are we going to do today? Let's do Bell 412. And as you can tell, we've got two different setups. There's a few aircraft like this, some that require uh, data to be taken on the ground and uh, like say at ground and then 100% before moving to flight. So we actually split those up into two different setups. So you'll have the initial and you'll have the flight setup. I'll go ahead and choose the flight setup. It's got a little more information in it. So now you have two options on the next screen. Uh, make a new setup based on this one. That's where if you wanted to modify that setup. I'm going to cover that again a little bit later. Uh, what we want to do is just view this setup but make no changes. So on the main screen here, we'll just kind of run through all these blocks uh, some of them I'm going to cover a little more than others, uh, but I'll try and provide the good information for what's in the setup so you have an idea. So obviously, block one is the name uh, for helicopters. Your vertical channel is always going to be channel A, and your lateral channel is always going to be channel B in main rotor. Your sensor type, what we use for the helicopters, the standard sensor is the 991D-1. That can be changed to a selection of different sensors. There's about six of them loaded in the analyzer. So if you had to use the Chadwick 7310, you had to use the 991V, 
uh, if you had to use, there's several others listed in there, one of those. You can use these arrow keys down at the bottom to, uh, when we, if you go in there to edit it, to change those, right? We're going to go over editing here later. The tack type, that's just telling the analyzer, am I using a mag pickup or am I using an optical? The tack channel, we're going to use tack channel one. Again, that's selectable. There's two channels, so you could choose channel two. Really not much of a, a, a need to use channel two, except for maybe troubleshooting. If you were having a tack problem and the normal setup is using tack channel one, uh, you can go in there and make a copy of this setup, change it to channel two, run the job and see if you have the same issue, see if it follows to kind of do some troubleshooting. Number of weight positions, obviously that's weight positions on your rotor head, number of blades, uh, pretty simple. The relative to, that's two different ways to display the track picture. We can display the track picture either relative to average, which is what this is, so all of the blades will be shown in, their, in a, a, a position relative to each other. Or we can change that to relative to one. Uh, and if we do that, or relative to two, in this case, we could choose one, two, three, or four, because there's four blades. If we lock it relative to a particular blade, your track picture, let's say relative one, one is always going to show on the track data screen as it's perfectly in track. It's going to be on the zero line, it's going to have no lead lag, and it's going to show you where every other blade is relative to that one. So that's just kind of a preference thing. It does not affect how the solutions are provided. It doesn't affect track at all. It is simply a different way of displaying the track picture. Uh, moving on, we've got obviously RPM uh, of the main rotor, which we're going to have to put in there. The RPM check, there's a filter for the RPM to prevent you from taking data at too low of an RPM. We don't want you taking data before you're at an operating speed that the, you would normally be at. Uh, the RPM check, though, is there are a few aircraft that are a little unique, and you have to take data at a reduced speed. Well, because of the way our RPM filter, the built-in RPM filter is, when you try and do that, it kind of messes the analyzer up. So we've put this in here, RPM check. MD500s do this, I believe. They do have a 70% or 68% check. Uh, if well, 407s do a, do a lower RPM check. So we will go in the setups for those particular aircraft and turn that RPM check off. Now that allows you to take the, R, the, the vibration data and track data at a lower RPM than specified over here in the balance RPM. Uh, moving on down, track units. Again, this is where we said it can be configured in either metric or inches. So customer's choice, uh, we, we do it by the OEM manual. If it's in inches, we put it in inches. If it's metric, we make it metric. Uh, this is, and that's how all of your uh, data will be displayed throughout when you're doing the balance job. It won't necessarily say 1.0 inch. You know, if you built your setup in inches, all of your data is going to be displayed in inches. The tab decimal, that we've ex actually just added that not too long ago. Uh, for example, Robinson's, which used thousands for uh, trim tabs, they needed a, a third decimal in order to be able to display that correctly. So that tab adjustment decimal is adjustable up to three decimals, and that changes how your tab adjustment is displayed. Rotors, uh, we've got the capability of working on the capability for the KMOV, so we can change that to two rotors. 99.9% uh, .9 of the time, that's going to be one, because we all just have one rotor. The conditions listed below are going to come out of the, main, uh, the manufacturer's manual also, right? So these are the tests that are required by the manual, uh, what condition you're in. We, we tend to, the helicopter guys tend to call that a regime in the analyzer, condition, regime, those are kind of synonymous in, in the analyzer. So anytime you see condition, uh, you can also supplant re regime in there. So we're going to do climb, 100 knots, 120 knots, VH, and then the thing that Bell likes doing, which is let down. They're the only ones that do it. Uh, the next box where it says both, uh, we can toggle that either way. We can leave it to both, and by choosing that, we're collecting vibration and track data. Uh, if you were just doing a custom setup and you wanted to just check ground track, say, uh, you could change that to track only or you could change that to vibe only. Really only use that for some troubleshooting features. That's the first screen, a lot of information, uh, but I wanted to cover this because I think it's important for you guys to know what's inside there. A lot of times I get, I, I have had some customers that, you know, they say, well, I don't really know what's in there, That's so I don't trust it, you know, and 
uh, if you don't trust it, you're, you're just basically not trusting the maintenance manual because that's really all that's in here is all the information from the aircraft. Uh, so we're going to press OK again. If you notice the screen got a little brighter there. The screen's got a, a setting in there where it'll, it'll start dimming down over time. You can adjust that also. Uh, that just helps conserve battery power a little bit. So we're on the tracking setup page now. When you're using the tracks, it needs uh, some information in order to calculate the adjustments. Uh, it has to have the rotor diameter. Now again, you can choose that in feet or uh, meters or metric, excuse me. Uh, lead lag, you can choose to have that, and I don't know why you would want one in one and one in the other. I typically, if I build a setup, it's all going to be in inches or it's all going to be in metric. I'm not going to confuse them all. Uh, blade one offset doesn't affect very many aircraft. It does affect aircraft, uh, say, like the Bell 407. When the number one blade is not over the nose during the tack event, then you will need to possibly put a little blade offset in there. What, what happens is the blade passes the tracks and then you have the tack event. It's going to pick up blade number two or vice versa. If it's before the tack event, it's kept collecting, it, it, it would grab blade four. Uh, so we can change that number to ensure we're catching the number one blade. If, which is the case for about 90% of the aircraft out there, uh, if the number one blade is dead on over the nose during the tack event, when your mag pickup and interrupter are aligned, or when your optical sensor and your tape are aligned, that's what the, the, the tack event is, then that number will be zero. I, got, I just got done saying we don't mix inches in metric. Sorry. Inches from mass center line is always in, minches, always in inches. Um, that is a measurement, and there's a, there's a picture of it in the application notes, which we're going to cover in the next webinar. Uh, that will show you it is a dimension coming down from the mast of the main gearbox, the rotor head mast, going forward to where the tracks is located in your windshield. And then it will show the degrees going up to uh, the main rotor blade, which is the next, uh, in next information we're going to have to enter. So what happens is the tracks needs to know how big the disc is, where it's located from the center line, and what angle we're aiming the tracks at the blades. If you give it all of that, it's going to know where the blade's at uh, and give accurate adjustments. The tracker inclination is figured out basically by mounting it in the lowest possible place, which we've done on most of these aircraft, and that's where we already have the numbers, and aiming a third of the way back from the tip cap. So that's where the tracks differs a little bit in optical tracker. It differs a little bit from uh, strobe tracking. Uh, or some other uh, cameras. Uh, you're going to aim one third of the way back from the tip cap. Typically, you're aiming at the trim tab if it's uh, if you've got trim tabs there. You're going to take the inclinometer that comes with the kit, stick it on top of the tracks, and see what that is. Uh, you won't have to do that for 99% of uh, the applications because we've already done the measurements and we've already put them in the analyzer. Hey Todd, we have, a, a we have a question. Yeah, we have a question yeah. from Vincent. Uh, he said sometimes I have problems with the tracks not de tracks not detecting, but I change the position of the aircraft where the sun uh, does not hit it directly. And it, is, is that normal? That yeah, that's that's certainly one hundred percent normal. I mean that that in fact, if you read the tracks uh, user's manual, it's one of the little troubleshooting steps in the back. Uh, sunlight directly into the optical lens of the tracks will uh, basically bleed out the, 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 uh, the signal or the, uh, the, the, the path for it, to come, for it to get the signal, and you won't get it. So there's a, there's a nice picture in the tracks manual that shows if the sun's at about you know, 12, 1 o'clock um, and you're aimed straight at the tracks, just pick the aircraft up, turn it a little bit, and, and you should be okay. Todd, also on that same note, again, I've talked to some customers before. Um, uh, like I said, on a cloudy, overcast day or something like that, depending on the blade color, yeah. does that take effect as well? Blade color should not affect it at all. There's a lot of aircraft out there where you, that, you know, it's a requirement to paint the blades. It's not a requirement to paint the blades. Uh, the fact is, low lighting on any type of optical tracker gets a little sketchy. So if it's late in the day or it's very cloudy, you might lose signal. That's just a function of how it works. It needs light in order to uh, capture the blades. It's not that 
uh, the blades not having paint on them are not what's missing out of that equation. It's the light, the contrast and the light from above the blades because the tracks needs to measure that in order to catch them. Thank so you. Even if you painted the blades, it wouldn't make a difference. Oh, and again, I another question. Yes, uh, sir. Yeah. Um, is from Eric. Is that how accurate does the tracker inclination value need to be? Well, here's the thing, it, and I'll talk about this in the, I guess, I don't know, three, I think, wherever, wherever I'm covering tracks. Uh, it needs to be accurate every time to be consistent. That's why I try to put, tell people, you know, when you mount the tracks in the window, take a little grease pencil, take something to mark on the side of the aircraft or wherever you're mounting it. So the next time you mount it in the same place, if you do that and you take that inclinometer that's included in the kit and put it at the degrees that's called out in the application note, you're going to be hitting the blade at the same place every time. I apologize. Which camera am I looking at? Oh, thank you. I'm like, uh, but you want to be, to be consistent and get consistent results, you need to mount it in the same place and, and then, uh, like I said, use your uh, inclinometer to put it at that degrees. If you're off a little bit, is it going to throw the adjustment way off? It's not. But it might make it, you know, it could be off enough to increase it another run. Uh, so it is important. It's not, you're, you're not going to be way off if you're, if it says 37 degrees and you put it at 39 degrees, it's not going to throw it completely off. But we do put the numbers and, like I said, the inclinometer in there to hopefully help you get more consistent results. Did I answer that? Yeah. Um, so moving on, uh, tracking planes. That is, if you, I think the only aircraft I can think of at the time is the, the old Sky Crane, S, the C-54, S-64, uh, Ericsson Sky Crane. If, uh, it's all one rotor head, but the, you track basically a staggered track. One's high, two lows, three's high, four's low, five's high, six is low. Uh, and that's where you would change that tracking planes to two if you needed to track those blades. The blade names down here, you can name them whatever you prefer. Again, in the uh, application note and in the setup, we're going to name them however uh, the manual called them out, whether it called it one, two, three, four by colors uh, if on a two bladed system, it might say target in blank uh, and so forth. But that's what we're going to use as what is in the manual. Now we're looking at the main rotor condition setup. This is where and I might have chosen, no, I chose an okay aircraft, okay. So, another change I want to mention right now, though, is previous to this version of software that a lot of you guys may not have yet until your analyzer comes through and gets calibrated where it'll get updated, or if you go to the website and download it. Previous versions of our software, we only had a place to put one vibration limit. So, it would be 0.2 for the entire main rotor job. Now we can put it in there for vertical or lateral and for each condition or regime. Uh, there are aircraft that have a little bit higher vibration limit on the ground and as it progresses through flight it gets a little bit lower. Uh, same thing with track. Uh, so we've been able to customize that, add that adder feature. Uh, it just makes it for a better, uh, a better overall balance. Now on the screen here you're seeing the conditions. You're seeing your limits for each different one. And again, like I said, this is in inches. It actually tells you up there above track that we're still talking about inches, so it's 0.25 or a quarter of an inch. Your vibe limits or vibe target is in IPS, 0.2 and 0.2. And we could go in and change those, customize them if we want. I know a lot of customers do that. A lot of guys started are realizing also that 0.2 is a fairly antiquated IPS number from way back in the day when we first started doing uh, track and balance. Uh, a lot of times it's easily achievable to get aircraft a lot smoother than that with the equipment uh, we have today. So I recommend lowering that a little bit, maybe down to 0.15 for most of them, and see if you can get it a little bit smoother. Um, you'll have a lot better uh, flying aircraft, less worn out parts, and so forth. Let's talk about the channel ID numbers under vertical lateral and then the track adjustment ID number. This is kind of how we control what we're going to provide you as a solution. And I think a lot of people have questions about this. So if you look at this under the vertical channel, we've got climb 100 and 120 all have a number one. By having the same number, that means those three conditions are going to be averaged together and you're going to be provided one adjustment for those three, so, or those three conditions. So if vertical was out, 
at climb 100 and 120, you're going to get one adjustment. If vertical is out at VH, you notice it's got a two, you're going to get a separate adjustment. Uh, another example is if that was one, two, three, four, five, you would get five separate adjustments if those were all out of limits. So anytime you see underneath a channel, either vertical, lateral, or track, items that have the same number, those are being averaged together. Obviously in this one, VH is going to get its own. Letdown has a zero. When you see a zero, that means we're monitoring it, but that zero means that we're, it, you're not going to get a solution for that. And, and by that, I mean the manual doesn't call out for that type of measurement to be corrected for. Uh, letdown in the bells is usually attacked by a lateral uh, solution anyway. And so if you go over to lateral, you'll see, and by using this 412 setup, like I said, it had a, a, an initial setup and a flight setup. If we went back to the initial setup, you would see that we've already, by the time you move to the flight setup, we've already taken care of lateral on the ground and in a hover doing the initial setup. That's why you see no lateral on here until you get the letdown. And let down, just one, it's going to have its own solution. Same thing uh, on the 412 with track. Most of the track is done on the ground there. They get that knife edge track as best as they can, and then they try not to worry about track except for at VH. And then we tell you again down here at the bottom, inner, inner ID, zero if no adjustments. Different charts use different IDs. So what that says is any place we put a number up here on the screen, these climb through 120, the VH, uh, the letdown, and this VH track, we've now generated a chart. What do I mean by a chart? I'm going to show you. After I show you this. <laughs> this screen here just uh, is adjustment positive value meaning. It's a fancy way of saying if I give you a positive number for a weight, Adjustment, common sense, we're adding weight, right? A negative one would be removing. Uh, if you get a positive adjustment that is a sweep adjustment, it's going to be sweeping the blade forward. The blade, we're going to be pitch linking up. Tab, we're going to be tabbing up. And solution logic, uh, we're not going to cover at this point because I don't want to, I could spend 20 minutes in there and I don't want to go down that rabbit hole. It's something uh, that if anybody has any questions about offline or wants to email me or give me a call, I'd be more than happy to talk to you about it, but I, I, I would run over my allotted time if I went down there. So like I said, every, every item over there that we put a number in front of generated a chart. This one, as you can tell, is vertical for climb through 120. So now that covers climb, 100 knots, and 120. There's a couple of different kinds of charts. As helicopter guys know, you can have a regular chart or you can have an irregular chart. Irregular chart simply means you've got span and cord, right? Two different types of adjustment or same type of adjustment that have different effects. Uh, this is a regular chart, which means all adjustments have the same amount of effect. Uh, sweep only, no, we're gonna say no. You can choose yes or no on there. If you have a blade that's indicated uh, by the manual that you cannot adjust, a master blade, Airbus, one of them, A350, the yellow blade, they don't want you adjusting. Uh, you can change that to match whatever blade it is you want, and then you will not get adjustments for it. Uh, max ICF update and rotation. Those are things that we use to control the setup. Uh, if you've been around ACES or had a 2020 or read any of our literature, you know that our analyzers learn. They learn by collecting data and adjustments and if they notice, or if the, the, if the analyzer sees that the weight chart, you know, if it said 20 grams equals an IPS, but we're really taking 25 grams in order to uh, resolve that one IPS, it's going to adjust this chart. It's going to adjust the measurement, this adjustment per IPS in here. So we control that a little bit because humans can put the wrong information in the analyzer and, and end up getting it balanced and then kind of screw up the algorithm. So Max ICF update, we're only going to allow the adjustment to be updated by 50%. The rotation is, a, is the chart. That refers to your move line. So we're going to let this move line get adjusted a little bit, but we don't want it to go crazy. So if the analyzer figures out that the number one or green, the weight position there, is really at 2 or 245, we're going to let it adjust a little bit. So that time, the next time when you use this setup, it's going to be tweaked and it should take you less runs.
Adjustment unit, that's where we name whatever it is uh, we're adjusting right here. So this one actually, and the app note will tell you the acronyms that we use in the setup. This is going to be outboard tab on the, on the Bell 412. And it's going to tell you that six, I forget what they use, probably IPS, or excuse me, IPS, probably six uh, degrees equals one IPS. That six degrees, if you do it to the green blade, it's going to have a move line at 130, blue at 1030. Once since it's a regular chart, once you've put the first two in, the analyzer knows what orange and red is, right? Tells you down here that your blade position is in clockwise or counterclockwise order, so you have to put them in order. Don't, don't put them in a wacky order. It won't take them. It won't work very well. And then again, this plus adjustment, that's from the couple of screens ago there, that positive, positive adjustment value. That's just a reminder that weight is adding sweep forward, blade up, and tab up. Now, we're going to have similar charts, vertical VH, right, because vertical climb through 120 had a 1, and then vertical VH had a 2, which means we need a chart to be able to generate a solution. So that's the second one for vertical. Same, all the same kind of information. This side is for inboard tab. If you notice, it's an IBT instead of OBT, so it's an inboard tab. Lateral for the letdown. Now we're using some weights. If we usually, usually if you see weights, that means in the app note or the manual, there's some specified weights. Uh, if not, you'll see grams or GMS. Uh, there's all kinds of different ways to attack that. Every manufacturer likes to do it a little bit different. So if you have a question about what the solution is, how it's presented, whatever the acronym is, look in the app note, which is also on the web page, available for download. And typically, if there's some odd ones, we'll list them in the front of the application notes so you guys can see that. Other than that, this screen is all the same as the previous two. Now we get to our tracking uh, chart setup for VH. And I don't even think this is a good one. But this is where that one VH uh, had a track adjustment on it. So if there's a condition, I've named it XXX, it's a flat 0 0.01 inches per, per uh, flat. I don't think that's correct. I apologize. I downloaded some setups and just threw them on here. Um, but this is where basically you're going to tell the analyzer if you're adjusting a trim tab or you're adjusting a pitch link, it would be how many flats equals one inch on my pitch link. Typically that would say PCL, right? So we're going to see a pitch link adjustment. It's going to be in flats. We know how many equal one inch. Uh, and then again, if you have a blade that you don't want to adjust or can't adjust, you can select it here. The max update percentage, this function is very similar to the uh, max ICF and the rotation. So this is again to uh, allow for learning, but not learning bad data on pitch link adjustments. And that's it. That was uh, quicker than I thought. Let's go back over to the screen. I'll show a couple of, uh, we got the loading, the setup, we did that. We have viewing a setup, we've done that. Editing a setup, why would you need to edit a setup? A couple of different reasons. Now, again, if it's locked, you will not be able to um, edit it. You will have to make a change. You will have to make a new one set or new setup based on this one, right? So we're gonna go over this one and just see what is in here we can change. We're doing the Bell 412 initial. And in this case, Somebody, you know, adjusted the mag pickup way too close and busted the top of it off on the rotor head. So now we've got to use an optical. So we can come in here and change that to optical. You're going to go up here and name it something different. Just so, i can back up here, you know you've changed it. What for, right? Oop. So now that we know that's for optical sensor. That's the only thing we need to change because we've uh, changed how we're doing our tack. We're going to press OK. These screens here, we're not going to change anything. Be careful not to scroll into any of them if that's all you want to change because you don't want to mess any of this stuff up. So just keep pressing OK. In order to save the setup, you're going to have to press OK through all these screens. Boom, and we're done. Now we'll go back one screen and we'll manage setups.
So it'll generate and then edit. That'll generate a list of uh, available setups. And you'll notice now there's a Bell 412 initial op, right, for optical sensor. You'll also notice that it doesn't have a version number and it's not locked. That block out there with a T in it means that it's locked by TEC. ASUS Systems is part of TEC. Uh, that's why that's there. So now you know that's a different setup. You can also use the uh, function key down at the bottom, function 2, to look at the details and see when it was created and when it was modified. Let's go back. Last thing I'll show you today, we'll create a report. Same thing, we're still looking at a setup, but since we made a different one, in case anybody wanted to know, if they, you know, they didn't understand, what, what's the op for? I don't know. Well, create a report. Now, once you've created a report, and I created one earlier, didn't I? We'll cover reports a little more in depth uh, later on. If you notice, though, the pending reports changed from, oh, I'm back on the analyzer right now. Sorry, Jarrett. Um, the pending reports changed back to two. I threw him a curveball. So, the pending reports changed to two. We're on the main menu now. I've created that uh, setup report. If you notice function one, it's got transfer report. You're going to press that. Your pending reports go to zero, and they are now on your USB drive. Take your USB drive, plug it into your computer. There's going to be a folder on that USB drive that says ACES underscore reports. Open that up, and the PDF files for that report is going to be there that you can view that setup and see all the information that's in it. Um, I think that's about setups, isn't it? That's, that's a lot of information. Um, I think it's important, though, to understand what's in there. Like I said, a lot of times there's questions about how we come up. You know, how do you get your solutions? Well, you know, we're plotting the solutions using the OEM polar charts in the setup. Uh, so we're not creating our own, we're not putting anything in there that's not already in the manuals for adjustments and so forth. Uh, so I just thought we needed to walk through that, give you a better understanding of what was inside the analyzer. And I think we need to wrap it up with final thoughts from Scott. Uh, <clears throat> said, uh, next week again we're going to go over the application notes, the tracks, optical tracker, checking the track uh, function and reviewing data and creating reports, which Todd's touched on a lot today. Um, one of the things, we've, we've provided a lot of information today. Todd's done a great job. Uh, ACES Systems, uh, we try to make the, uh, the analyzer, again, as simple and as easy and user-friendly, uh, which I think we've done that. Uh, again, and Todd being one of the best support guys, I think, in the industry, uh, does a very good job at uh, explaining. Uh, the, the, the analyzer. So again, if any questions regarding uh, uh, wanting to upgrade, uh, please contact sales at asysystems.com. We'll talk to you. I know there's a couple of questions about cost on the uh, how much it would be to upgrade from an old 2020 to the Cobra 2. Please contact the sales at asysystems.com. Uh, and if you have any te more technical questions uh, in between the webinar series, also give Todd a, a quick email at support at asysystems.com. Again, thank you all again for attending. I look forward to seeing you next week.